Welcome back to the channel, everybody. It is I, your host, Mr. Sean. Thank you for joining me once again on Chimera Miniatures' official YouTube channel. If this is your first time on the channel, I use this channel as a way to pitch my business, which is, of course, Chimera Miniatures. Chimera Miniatures is a custom miniatures business. I deal in both repainted hero clicks, both uh, ordinary and not safe for work varieties, as well as what I like to call chimeras, which are kit bashed miniatures pieced together from bits and pieces of various different miniatures into something that is one of a kind and something you will not find anywhere else. I sell these on both my eBay and Etsy pages, links are in the description, as well as if you'd like to reach out to me either via email or social media, links also in the description, I can make you something custom. So I was at my day job and the topic of kids you know you know what's wrong with these kids today came up and of course someone always mentions that these kids have too much screen time they're glued to their phones to their devices you know they're never away from a screen and that got me thinking well what are they supposed to do there are no toy stores anymore kids don't play with toys like yeah my parents limited my screen time as a kid but i also had a host of action figures micro machines legos what have you and these days, one, toy stores don't really exist, and two, the toys that are available are expensive. Like, why constantly buy your kid Lego sets if for one price you can buy them Minecraft and they'll have unlimited Legos? Or, I remember Barbie dolls that you would see back in the day would be like 10, 12 bucks. I mean, again, they were the really expensive ones, but I see toys at Walmart that are more or less Barbie dolls that are like $40 and it's like who the heck has that kind of money to spend on a kid? Of course you're gonna shove them in front of a screen because toys are more of a novelty collector's item than they are actual toys anymore. And as a toy maker and all that, that got me thinking, you know, about toy stores of years past. So today, we're gonna break away from our traditional RPG horror stories, neckbeard stories, what have you, and today I'm going to talk about 8 toy stores of days gone by. This isn't really a top 10 list, these aren't in any particular order except maybe in how much I personally experience these and even then that's there's not really an order to this. But I also wanted to stay away from stores that more or less simply got bought out by an identical store. Like when I was researching stores for this video, I came upon a store called Circus World and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then I read on it and it was like, oh, it just became, it got bought out and became KB Toys. So I'm gonna try and stay away from stores that were just bought out by almost identical retailers and just, just got more like a name swap, but more or less continued on. So these are gonna be ones that were unique, that were distinct, and then now have ceased to be. All right, so first on our list, we have Lionel Kitty City, AKA Lionel Play World. So while I was not ever familiar with this brand of toy store personally, I was familiar growing up with the Lionel train sets. But Lionel Play World was in one form or another, whether it was Kitty City, Lionel Toy Warehouse, or the Play World, it existed from 1969 until 1993. According to Wikipedia, it was for a time the second largest toy retailer store chain in the United States. Like with many toy store chains, it had its periods of growth, its ups, its downs, it, it, had it filed for bankruptcy a couple times due to various recessions. The company had to fight a few attempted buyouts, which hurt them financially, as well as the rise of non-specialty uh, stores oh, uh, expanding their toy departments. And, you know, specialty toy stores like Lionel were more expensive and therefore could not necessarily compete with these other stored brands like Walmart and whatnot. Unfortunately, by the time 1992 rolled around, they really weren't able to, re to rebound anymore. They did attempt a merger with what was at the time the number three toy retailer in the United States, Child World, which will actually be the next entry on our list, but that wasn't able to happen. It fell through, and by June of 1993, Lionel stores were no more. Seeing that I was born in the late 80s and by the time the 90s rolled around, the only place even near me in Ohio that had a Lionel store would have been Cleveland, Ohio. This one was just never one I was going to encounter, so it sounds like it was probably a pretty cool store. I wish I could have seen it back in the day, but sadly, it is no more. 
Fortunately though, the Lionel brand of trains has managed to continue into the present day under its current, current Lionel LLC uh, brand. Again, I don't have a lot of insight on this one as I never actually went to a Lionel Play World. I just thought it was neat finding out that Lionel had a toy store once upon a time. Next on our list, we have Child World, aka Children's Palace. I know I said I was going to stay away from stores that just got bought out, but this one's kind of interesting because what I knew this as back in the day very briefly was Children's Palace. However, Child World actually bought out Children's Palace and then adopted uh, Child Children's Palace had like kind of a castle looking storefront, which is really cool. And then once Child World bought them out, they kind of adopted that too. And the thing with where these stores were is they modified the entrances and the storefronts so much to fit this theme that you can still find these buildings today. You wouldn't necessarily know that's what you were looking at if you didn't know what you were looking for, but I think that's really cool. So Child's World uh, was originally founded in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1962 by Sid Schneider and Joseph Arnisano. In 1975, they uh, acquired Children's Palace, and this made them the second largest toy retailer after Toys R Us, which will be on this list later. And one of the things that was really cool is they had a very aggressive store placement plan in that they basically kept opening stores just down the road from Toys R Us, so they were really Toys R Us's like main source of competition. Now again, a lot of kids who grew up in the 80s and early 90s remember children's palace or child world and as just as good if not even better in some cases than toys r us however my experience was a little different child's world did dec start its decline in the 1980s they did change up their their store layout in 89 uh, to be more competitive with and similar to toys r us but 1990 was a really bad year for ch children's world Sorry, Children's Palace. I'm gonna call it Children's Palace for the rest of this video because that's the store I knew. Apparently in 1990, they fired a bunch of their top level executives and there was also no must have toy that year, like previous years, the 80s was full of must have toys. Teddy Ruxpin or the Cabbage Patch Kids, but there was 1990, the first year of the 90s, none of that. So it really was hard to drive people into the stores when there wasn't a must-have toy. It got so bad that they couldn't pay their bills and certain vendors like Lego just wouldn't extend them credit anymore and it meant that they started having nothing on their shelves. As stated in the previous entry, they tried to merge with Lionel Kitty City to kind of, you know, merge forces and become the dominant and able to compete with Toys R Us, but they just, neither company was doing well enough to be able to secure the funding for this, and the deal fell through. And by 1992, they would also cease to exist. Now, I mentioned briefly my experience with Children's Palace, and that was, I just remember, I vividly remember as a kid, going in there with my mom, in the stores like waning days, so this would have been around 91, 92, you know, I would have been three, maybe four years old. And I just remember they had hardly anything on the shelves. I think she was there to pick up a gift for somebody else, and I just remember walking through thinking, wow, this place is a dump. And there was literally a Toys R Us right down the street, so I was thinking like, why the hell aren't we going there? But yeah, apparently back in its heyday, this place would give Toys R Us a run for its money, so I kind of wish I could have seen it back then. I mean, I love the fact that I was a 90s kid, but God, the 80s seemed fun. Alright, the rest of the entries on the list will be ones that I actually did have quite a bit of experience with. So our next entry is Zany Brainy. Not nearly as long-lived as the previous two entries, Zany Brainy was founded in 1991 and only lasted until 2003. Still, not a bad run, but certainly not as long as lasting from the 60s to the 90s. Now, I remember when they built a Zany Brainy in my hometown, well, technically one town over. Honestly, in central Ohio, it's, it doesn't feel like you're entering a new town when you enter a new town, so. But I remember they opened it up and there was this big to-do about it, but Zany Brainy was a, it was a, it was under the FAO Schwartz banner, not that that was really something I knew at the time, but it was an educational toy store, and they built it in my, uh, my home location right across from the Toys R Us I went to as a kid. And 
all I, what I really remember about this place is one, their toys were really expensive, and they were all educational, so they weren't nearly as fun as like the Legos, I mean, they might have had Legos, but like the action figures and the micro machines and the creepy crawlers that Toys R Us was selling for cheaper than any of this educational garbage right across the street. And apparently Zany Brainy's downfall wasn't that it sold toys that were not fun, but rather they kind of flew too close to the sun when they uh, bought out the rival company Noodle Kadoodle in 2000, and they eventually uh, just suffered from financial difficulties ever since and ended up having to file Chapter 11 in 2020, in, in, sorry, 2001, and then closed in 2003. I personally don't know a single person who was sad to see Zany Brainy go. Fun fact though, David Schlesinger, the founder of Zany Brainy, would later go on to found a Five Below, which is still up and running and is a very popular store. I guess Dave learned that a fun beats education any day of the week. Next up we have KB Toys. Now I went to a lot of different KB Toys. I went to the KB Toy outlets. Like this was a mainstay of my childhood, but the KB Toys I remember most was the one at the City Center Mall in Columbus, Ohio. That was the store where I first got to test out a Sega Genesis that I later got for Christmas that year. And City Center being this massive multi-story mall, I think it had like four or five stories, I believe, like maybe three, I don't, I think it was definitely four or five. It was huge, absolutely massive before they tore it down. And my mom would do all of her shopping in there. We drive from the suburbs into Columbus and we would spend all day at this place, and if I was really good, I might get to get a toy from KB Toys. And by comparison to a Toys R Us, KB Toys stores were tiny. They were always in the mall or a strip mall. Like, they weren't standalone. They weren't like a freestanding store. But they just packed so much toys into this. Like, I remember... There were, uh, I definitely remember going with my mom and grandma, and the first time I ever got a pack of Monster in my pocket was at that KB Toys. I mean, for as little space as they had to work with, they had so much stuff. And KB Toys actually has a really interesting, interesting history. It was founded in 1922 as Kaufman Brothers, a wholesale candy store, and would become a wholesale toy store in 1946. Two years after that, they gave up on candy entirely and just became a full-on toy store. Their retail stores started up in the 1970s under the name KB Toy and Hobby. Now, KB Toys was a mainstay of the 90s, and any 90s kid will tell you. If you went to a mall, there was a KB Toys, because in 1999, by that time, by the end of the 90s, there was 1,324 locations across the United States, making them the second largest toy retailer in the United States. It seems like the second place uh, moniker, like a lot, of the, the, a lot of the stores on this list will have that at some point. But, you know, it makes sense because by this time, Children's Palace was gone, Lionel Store was gone. So, I mean, who else to compete with the big boy Toys R Us other than the store that was in every mall in the, in the country, KB Toys? Unfortunately, a combination of the recession as well as the kind of death of the American mall in the early 2000s is really what spelled the end for KB Toys. They started having to close stores, they filed for bankruptcy in 2005, they ended up filing, filing Chapter 11 in 2008, and by the time they went defunct in 2009, you know, what had once been over a thousand stores, they were down to about 460. And ultimately, unfortunately, KB Toys was a product of the times, and the times changed and uh, their business model wasn't able to support it. Mall rent was expensive and with less and less people going to the malls, uh, it was hard to make do. But I, I, one of the things I remember most about the other KB Toys was not the main branch KB Toy stores, but rather the KB Toy outlets. And these were places, usually you found them in strip malls, and it would have, it wouldn't have the t like the brand new toys. It would have some of the slightly older ones. And that was really cool though, because you could find some stuff you just didn't see at Toys R Us, at Big Lots, at the Family Toy Warehouse that was still a thing at the time, or even at other KB Toys. So you could find some stuff that was from like earlier in the 2000s. If you were really lucky, you might even find uh, something from the 90s. But this was the quintessential mall toy store and it was really sad when it went away. 
They tried to revive it back in like 2018 and it just, they couldn't get the funds and it never happened. One interesting thing I found out about KB Toys while researching this was actually there was a lawsuit back in 1999 that they were accused of discrimination because they stopped accepting personal checks as payment in places, in locations that had an overabundance of, you know, bounced checks. So the Equal Rights Center filed this suit because they said that KB Toys was discriminating against black people, which KB Toys said no. The racial demographics have nothing to do with it. It's simply by number of checks, and they kind of also came back with, we don't accept checks from white people in these locations either. And it looked like that lawsuit went all the way into 2003, but I was not able to see anything about how it turned out, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. Personally, I think retailers just need to stop accepting checks altogether. I used to hate when I worked at the grocery store and people paid with checks. They're just annoying, and, and people, if you have a debit card, you don't need a checkbook. And if you have a debit card, that means you have a checking account. So you don't, you, if you have a check, you should have a debit card. So now that we're about halfway through this list and I've gotten you thinking about toys, I just wanted to remind you Chimera Miniatures Etsy page is right now running a 20% off sale on all items. In my previous video, I did say that that sale was going through uh, February 16th, 2023. I misspoke. It's actually good until February uh, through February 17th. So there's one extra day. It's good through that Friday. It will not end on Thursday. Throughout the week, I will be adding more miniatures to the Etsy page. Like I briefly said in the last video, I have only recently restarted my Etsy page, so don't worry. If you don't see anything, check back uh, the next day, heck, even a few hours, because there will be constantly more of my stock will be uh, posted there. And hey, if Etsy's not your thing, these uh, items are also available on eBay, or if you're not seeing anything you like but you want a custom miniature, Reach out to me on my email or my socials and uh, we'll see what I we can do. My rates for commissions are very reasonable. It's a base uh, price of $10 per miniature, plus the cost of materials, which is any minis I have to outright buy to make your mini, and then shipping. So again, very reasonable rates compared to some other sellers you will find doing similar things. And now let's get back to the lists. Next up, guys, we have one that's kind of cheating as it's not officially defunct yet, but it is on its way to being defunct, even though the company that owns it is not hurting at all. I'm talking, of course, about the Disney Store. The Disney Store has been around since 1987. Unlike the stores we've talked about so far that were mostly American, if, only, if, if not only American stores, Disney had stores all over the world. These stores were in malls. They You could go in, you could get really cool Disney merchandise, really expensive Disney merchandise. Uh, but I remember there was one at City Center. There wasn't one at Tuttle Mall, uh, which was the other mall, the mall that kind of replaced City Center. But then eventually they did get one at Polaris Fashion Place. But why this, uh, you know, okay, these, these are great. They're everywhere. So why is it on this list? Well, that's because Disney has decided to phase them out. Because while at the end of the 90s there were over 800 stores, today there are only about 22 left as Disney is deciding not to operate their own stores and malls. Again, malls, mall rent is expensive, there's minimal traffic these days, but they are phasing into offering their products at various Target retailers. I remember as a kid, I was really into Peter Pan, but not specifically the character of Peter Pan. I loved Captain Hook. And I remember in the 90s going into the City Center Disney store and getting pirate swords because I wanted to be Captain Hook. I think I also got a Captain Hook hook, as well as I know I had like the officially licensed Disney Captain Hook children's costume, and I we probably bought that there. But you know, the fact that Disney has been in business, or the Disney store has been in business for 35 years, uh, it's definitely, they've gone through a lot of aesthetic changes over time. And I gotta say that my favorite one, which uh, apparently in the most recent, like big wide launch of store closings, the final one of these that was still around closed was, I love this 
pink and green store layout. It's very 80s, very early 90s. It's even though I, I had access to a Disney store at the Polaris Mall location until very recently, this is always what I think of when I think of the Disney store, and this brings a lot of nostalgia, and I'm sad that there aren't any stores with this look anymore. But ultimately, I think Disney just kind of realized that they can sell their products anywhere, and they don't need to rent space in a mall in order to do it. Next on the list, we have one that I can't find too much information about, but I definitely remember going here. It was called Family Toy. And I distinctly remember there being a location near Tuttle Mall, as well as one in Lancaster, Ohio. What makes Family Toy stand out in my mind is that it was like a Toys R Us sized KB Toys. They were definitely large stores, but they had a uniquely KB Toys feel. I'm kind of amazed I couldn't find more information on this because apparently I was only able to find one article in the Post Gazette uh, com business section from 2002 when they were closing because again the toy sales post 9-11 the recession it was very hard on a lot of the toy businesses but this company began way back in the 20s when Milton D. Meyer was selling novelty items to circuses and carnivals so literally this started out as a family toy business that would sell the cheap toys that you saw at the games at carnivals. I remember playing the video game demos there. I also distinctly remember uh, buying Pokemon stuffed animals there, as well as it was the place where I bought my first ever Simpsons action figure, which was the Bart Simpson uh, Playmates Talking Simpsons toy. That would have been around 2000 when I did that, and probably 1999 or 98, when I bought the Pokemon toy. I'm not entirely sure because, again, I can't find much information on this company, but from what I read, it seems like that might be because this was mostly an Ohio toy retailer, which is why I would have come across it. Next up, we have one of my all-time favorite toy stores. Many of you probably know this one. It is F.A.O. Schwartz. This store was the place of the bougiest of Barbies, of the poshest of plushies. This was the store among stores. So this one is technically formerly defunct. It was defunct, but it has risen from the ashes like a phoenix and now does currently have six locations. Most are pop-up stores, but uh, I'm going to talk about what these used to be. Now, FAO Schwartz is America's oldest toy store. The original one opened and known at, uh, under the name Toy Bazaar in Baltimore back in 1862 and was founded by Frederick August Otto Schwartz. In 1870, another location in New York was opened called the Schwartz Toy Bazaar and eventually the name was changed to F.A.O. Schwartz. Now, uh, the company was purchased from the descendants of Frederick in 1963 and they were going to pay them royalties and eventually choose to drop the name however they renewed the contract to be able to use the name because of just how prestigious the fao schwartz name was and then over the years the company would hit uh would go through different owners face different hardships there were some bankruptcies and eventually they were purchased by toys r us their stores were shut down and their products were sold exclusively in Toys R Us. Since the closure of that store, uh, it has actually been bought again, the, the use of the name has been bought by the descendants of the founder and is sold through uh, the 360 group. As stated before, there have now been stores that have reopened and you can also find them in places like Target. But the iconic uh, FAO Schwartz, in my mind, will always be their New York and the one I went to, Chicago, store. Now, I never went to the New York store, so I cannot speak for what was there. But I went to the Chicago location many times. My grandmother's favorite city of all time was Chicago. And back in the 90s, it was very easy to just get a plane ticket and take a short flight from Ohio over to Illinois and go to Chicago. So every year for her birthday, that's exactly what we did. The Chicago FAO Schwartz location was, I, it was three or four stories tall. I wanna say it was three. 
and each floor had a different theme. Like I remember stuffed animals, there was like novelty items. I remember my mom finding the uh, fart putty known as Flubber and buying it for literally everyone in her family that Christmas. I remember the top floor was like video games and action figures. They were also known for their giant uh, walkable, it was a piano keyboard you could walk across. If you've seen the movie Big, you've seen that. They had life-size stuffed animals. Heck, they even had a like one of those little kitty cars that you could literally drive around and it was like encrusted in crystals. Like this was a luxury brand. But my biggest memory of FAO Schwartz was from the 90s, of course, when I was a kid, but it was a very specific situation. So if you've watched this channel before, uh, you might have heard me say that I, uh, as a kid, I was diagnosed with ADHD, Asperger's-like tendencies, not actual Asperger's, but I had a, a host of mental issues as a kid. I mean, technically I still do, but I've just learned how to deal with them without medication. But in the 90s, there was this thought that ADHD could be cured by fixing vitamin deficiencies that would then end the chemical deficiencies in your brain permanently. Like, it wasn't like a, you have to do this forever and... You, but no, it was literally thought you could cure ADHD. It really didn't pan out. But I remember my grandmother paid for my parents to put me into this, uh, you know, experimental treatment. And one of the things they had to do before you could be in the treatment was they had to test your blood. So one day my mom and I hopped on a plane, flew to Chicago, rented a car, drove to the clinic, where they drew several vials of my blood. Now, looking back, it probably wasn't that many. But as a little kid who was terrified of needles and had a blood phobia, this was one of the worst days of my life. And my mom, to help me feel better after that it all happened, one, drove me into downtown Chicago, took me to my favorite restaurant, Ed DeBevix. And if you've never been to Ed DeBevix, it's amazing. Their whole shtick is that they're rude to you. Their slogan is eat and get out, and it has this whole 50s diner aesthetic. Though I still remember that our waitress had the audacity to not be rude to us. I remember that to this day. I was a child. I had gone through a traumatic experience. I demanded rudeness, and I did not get it. But after lunch, my mom took me to FAO Schwartz and bought me a Spider-Man action figure. And I had that Spider-Man action figure until he eventually fell to pieces and I had to throw him out, but I just remember on that day that was a pretty rough day for me that that Spider-Man figure and that trip to FAO Schwartz, it meant the world to me. So yeah, FAO Schwartz still exists, but I don't think it is what it once was and that what it once was was pure magic. And then coming in at the number one spot on our list, guys, you knew what this was going to be the entire time. It's Toys R Us. Unless you were living under a rock for the last 74 years, you know what Toys R Us is. FAO Schwartz might have been the luxury toy store, but to among toy stores and among kids, Toys R Us was a god. I've talked to you about various toy experiences I remember from other stores on this list, but I couldn't even begin to recount all of the toys I purchased from Toys R Us. As a kid, I had a massive Lego and Micro Machines collection. I mean, minis have always been big in my life, and I would say probably 90% of those came from this store. Probably at least 80% of my action figures came from this store. Probably at least 75% of the video games I purchased up until the store closed in 19, I'm sorry, not 19, 2018 came from this store. Heck, I remember I used to pre-order games from Toys R Us because having a little sister who had a lot of friends who were constantly having birthday parties, the chance that my mom would have to go to Toys R Us to buy a birthday present for some kid meant that she could pick up that game when it came out the day it came out on her way home from work. My childhood would have been entirely different were it not for Toys R Us. Like we've seen on this list previously, Toys R Us didn't even start as a toy store. In 1948, Charles P. Lazarus made a baby furniture store called Children Children's Bargain Town in Washington, D.C., specifically during the post-war baby boom. They switched their focus to toys in 1957, and the very first Toys R Us 
was born in Rockville, Maryland. At their height, Toys R Us had over a thousand locations. They had general toy stores, they had baby stores, they even had like a kid's clothing store called Kids R Us. And I remember distinctly that that Toys R Us that I've mentioned a few times in this video, there for a while was a Kids R Us right next to it. And my mom would go there to look for clothes for me and for sometimes other family members that she was buying clothes for, their kids. And I remember sitting there being so goddamn bored because there was a Toys R Us right next door. Like you could be on the one wall and be like, I can sense the toys. Now, Kids R Us, fortunately for me, went under in 2004. Now, I was long since outgrown their clothes by that point, but God, I hated that location. But Babies R Us and Toys R Us did last until 2018. And ultimately, the downfall of Toys R Us, like we've seen so many times, is just that what kids wanted in their toys and their entertainment changed. There were no more must-have toys, and the majority of things you wanted could be bought online. But from the 70s, 80s, 90s, even into the 2000s, if there was a toy you had to have, Toys R Us had it. If you've ever heard about fights breaking out in stores over Tickle Me Elmo's, I guarantee you at least 80% of those fights happened in a Toys R Us. The same with people fighting over Cabbage Patch Kids or the in anything really. Like if it was a must-have toy, Toys R Us had it and if there were fights that were going to break out of it over it, it was going to happen at a Toys R Us. I remember distinctly going to Toys R Us after church one day and there's people lined up waiting for them to open. We have no idea why. Apparently they've gotten in a shipment of Furbies and people really want them. That's not what we were there for. I think Furbies are creepy as hell. But I remember we got in line and the guy, we're like, what's going on? The, the guy in front of us goes, uh, they just got some Furbies in. And we're like, oh, okay. And he's like, you better not try to get ahead of me. And we're like, we don't want a damn Furby. But just to put into perspective how important Toys R Us was to the toy selling industry, after they closed their doors in 2018, which they closed in June of 2018, that November, Fortune Magazine noted that the absence of Toys R Us during the 2018 holiday season represented a US $400 billion chunk of toy sales that other retailers could, retailers could pick up on since it wouldn't be there for Toys R Us to. $4 billion for basically the month of December. Now, apparently, much like FAO Schwartz before it, which Toys R Us actually did buy FAO Schwartz for a while, their brand for a while, but uh, Toys R Us has also emerged from the ashes, and there are several locations that have been popped up and remade in nine states. California, Georgia, New Jersey, Illinois, Nevada, Louisiana, New York, Maryland, and Missouri. Maybe we'll get one in Ohio eventually. And that's our video, folks. Uh, thank you for sticking with me. If you were expecting some, like, a hardcore educational history lesson, I apologize, because what you got was me reminiscing about toy stores as I get progressively drunker over the course of several alcoholic beverages. But ultimately, I am fascinated by the history of toys. I think you can tell a lot about a society and an era by what kind of toys were popular because as my father always told me people speak with their money i am myself a toy maker in a certain sense and as such toys have always interested me specifically miniatures you know i mean hey, chimera miniatures who to thunk it but i've had the idea that i wanted to do a video about toys or defunct stores or whatever because I'm just, I'm amazed, and I think, honestly, hey, guess what? It's the obligatory fiancé reference. I think my fiancé gets really tired when we're driving around and go, oh, that used to be that store, and that used to be that store, and oh, I remember that store, I got that thing at that store. But for me, that's, that's like core memories of like my childhood was going to toy stores and just being in amazement of what all was there and remembering what I got, and for me, like, being a problematic, badly behaved kid, and the idea that if you were good, you got to pick out a toy, it was not just a reward, it was validation for me doing better as a human being. So toy stores have a very special place in my heart. 
And I get that things have changed and kids no longer are, you know, they, they're more, it's, it's all about the screens now and that's fine. Things like that are going to change, but I do feel very blessed to have grown up in the time of analog toys and getting to go and pick out an action figure or a micro machine set or a Lego set at the Toys R Us, at the KB Toys, at the FAO Schwartz. And I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. And thank you. Thank you for listening to me rant about my <laughs> stupid memories. If you like what you hear on this channel, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, as well as go check out that 20% Etsy sale. Maybe go to my eBay, maybe send me a message about possibly ordering, commissioning a custom miniature. Help keep this channel alive. Until next time, guys, I'm Mr. Sean. This is Chimera Miniatures, and I hope you alpha great day and an even beta tomorrow. Bye bye